السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا كريم uh, before we begin uh, and we do review have a short quiz before we begin all that just a very important announcement next week inshallah the class is going to be uh, a bit earlier we're going to start at 6:30 6.30 p.m. and we're going to finish by Salat al-Isha. Salat al-Isha is going to be, um, I think they come by like around 7.25 or around that. Because we have the games night right after. Right? So we have a brother's game night uh, right after. <clears throat> so next week we're going to be starting earlier and we'll finish for Salat al-Isha and then after that will be uh, the brother's game night. Okay? And then <clears throat> the week after that will be our final class inshallah before Ramadan. Alright, uh, uh, as usual inshallah we're going to start with quiz. Review quiz. Uh, so, once again, if you want to join the quiz, make sure that you are in the WhatsApp group. If you're not in the WhatsApp group, you can scan the, bar, uh, the, uh, the QR code and you can join the WhatsApp group for updates of the classes and links to uh, anything that we post. Uh, for sisters who have questions, we're going to post the number, the text number, in the WhatsApp group. All right, instead of having it on the screen, we're going to have it on the WhatsApp group. So you can refer to that number if you have any questions to text you in the class, inshallah. All right, if you look at the, uh, the, the WhatsApp group, we just posted the, the quiz link. So you can click on that, and then uh, we will... Started, get started in short All right, so if you'd like to join the quiz, you can click on that. You can click on that uh, WhatsApp link. All right, as the usual format is the multiple choice. All right, multiple cho choice quiz. Just make sure you answer within <coughs> the time frame. All right, let's give uh, everyone another maybe 10 or 20 seconds or so, and then we'll start. So this is what we went over previously in the last week. So if you weren't here last week, then you know, try your best, inshallah. All right, uh, let's begin. We'll begin, inshallah. So once again, answer within the 20 second time limit. Uh, starting now, first question, bismillah. Was the first sin to have been committed in the heavens? First sin to be committed in the heavens. <clears throat> that was the sin of what? Hasad, pride. I mean, uh, yeah, envy. Envy, right? Envy. The shaitan was envious of Adam alayhi salam when Allah created Adam alayhi salam and he said that I'm better than him. Why should I prostrate to somebody who I'm better than? This was the first sin and this would caused him to be <coughs> uh, cursed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All right, next question. Wine, alcohol is forbidden in both this life as well in the hereafter. True or false? And the answer is false. All right, we said that there is 
alcohol wine in the hereafter. Those who answer true, you guys don't want halal wine in the hereafter. <laughs> there is alcohol, but it is removed from all the uh, all of the evil properties of alcohol in this life. It is going to be removed, and it will be pure alcohol, and there will be a river of alcohol for the believers in paradise. And we went we went over the, we went over the hadith. Whoever drinks alcohol in this life and they do not repent, then they will be prevented from the alcohol in the next life. Right, but this is the pure alcohol, this is not the alcohol that we have in this life. All right, next question. Allah subhanahu, subhanahu wa ta'ala ta will not look at this person on the day of judgment. All right, so the one who drags his garment uh, out of pride, the one who drives, drags his garment out of pride, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not look at that person on the day of judgment. And this is called, uh, the Arabic term for it is isbal, isbal, dragging the garment out of pride. All right, the next question. The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever plays backgammon or something very similar has <clears throat> done something, this is a typo here, has done something similar to, should be, should say, has done something. All right, so whoever plays backgammon or whatever that game was very similar to backgammon in those days, it is like dipping your finger in the meat and blood of swine. Swine is pig, right? The pig. All right, next question. Which wife of the Prophet ﷺ was wrongfully accused of being unchaste? All right, this was <clears throat> Aisha radiallahu anha. And this whole incident was called Haditatul Ifk. Al Ifk is known in, in, in the story of Al Ifk, the, the slander. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed a number of verses from which surah addressing this and clearing Aisha of any wrongdoing. Which surah? Surah Nur. Allah revealed uh, the beginning part of Surah Nur, all uh, clearing Aisha radiallahu anha. All right, next question. It is not allowed for a Muslim to break off relations with his brother for more than how many consecutive nights? Three, all right, three consecutive nights. Three, three consecutive nights, this is the cooling off period, where if you have a problem or an argument or any type of uh, issue with one of your fellow brothers, then you can take this three, three night period. After that, then they must go back on speaking terms. And the best of the two is the one who starts off with the salam. So there's a problem between you, you wait up to three nights, and after that, you have to give the salam. And the other person must respond, and this will, uh, this will remove any sin on, on, on their part. All right, next question. Every drink that intoxicates is forbidden. True or false? The answer is true. This is a hadith. Hadith. 
كله مسكر حرام everything that intoxicates is حرام alright uh, last question last question the prophet صلى says Allah is beautiful and he loves beauty and this thing is to be ungrateful and to belittle people this is to be ungrateful and belittle people answer is arrogance right arrogance is to uh, reject the truth and belittle people all right Looks like we have a new uh, new champion tonight. Third place, Brother Ural. Second, Brother Roshan, who has the defending champion, and Brother Riyad, mashallah, has taken the uh, the prize for tonight. All right, uh, we can get started, inshallah. All right, we left off. Uh, on the, the 40, 45th. <clears throat> the 45th branch of Iman. Al Khamis wal Arba'un min Shu'ab al Iman. Ikhlas al Amal lillahi azza wa jal. Wa Turk al Riyah. Bikawli ta'ala wa ma umiru illa li abdullah muqtusina lahuddin hunafa. The 45th branch of Iman is sincerity. Ikhlas, sincerity, so that one's actions are only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you avoid all types of riya. Riya is uh, essentially showing off, doing things for show. Doing things for show. And uh, there are two terms, right? two related terms. There's riya. Riya is where you do things for other people to see. And then there's another term called al ujub. Al ujub. Ujub is where a person they start to think highly of themselves. So they're not doing things for other people, but they become very impressed with themselves. Right? They become very impressed with themselves. And uh, both of these people, they're not doing their actions solely for the sake of Allah. One person is impressed with himself, his own actions, and another person is doing things for others to see. So uh, this is a related term. And uh, the ayah, وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ مُخْرِسِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ they were only commanded to worship Allah sincere, sincere in their deen to Him, and to be of those inclining to the truth. And then a number of verses are brought where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala emphasizes that uh, if you want the dunya, you will have it. But if you want the akhirah, then you can also have that. And up to a person's choice. Whoever de desires, man can you read the akhirah, nazid lahu fi harfi. Whoever desires the harvest of the hereafter, then we will increase for him in, this, in his harvest. And whoever desires the harvest of this world, if you want the dunya, you want what is in the dunya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says you can have it. You can have it. However, if you choose this world over the next life, then you won't have what's in the next life. We give him thereof, but there is not for him in the hereafter any share. This is the, for the person who chooses the dunya over the akhirah, meaning they choose the haram. Right? They choose the haram, not that they choose to, to take part in halal of the dunya. We can have that as well. Right, this is why we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the good in this life and the next life. Rabbana atina bid dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana. We can have both. Right, the good of this life and the good in the next life. Uh, but if you choose the prohibited in this life, then you are setting yourself up for not having the, your share in the, in the next life. And the verse, whoever desires the life of this world and its dormants, we fully repay them for their deeds therein, and they were, therein they will not be deprived. Those are the ones from there is not in the hereafter but the fire All right, so they will have whatever they want in this life but in the hereafter they will be deprived and lost there they did therein and worthless is what they used to do and the verse whoever would hope for the meeting with his lord let him do righteous work and not associate in the worship of his lord anyone and then we have the hadith of sahih muslim abu huraira radiallahu anhu narrates that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Anna aghna shuraka anis shirk. I am in less need of partners than anyone. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is uh, one of his characteristics, is that he does not accept 
anyone to share with him in anything that is exclusively his. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not share in things that are exclusively his. So worship is exclusively due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so anyone who does an action and they have mixed intentions, they have mixed intentions. So maybe it's like 80% you're doing it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 20% is for other worldly means. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this hadith, hadith Qudsi, that I'm not in need of any partners. So if you set up a partnership with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will cancel all of it. Therefore, when a man does anything for my sake and for the sake of somebody else, so you're mixing, you're, you're, you are making a partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in deeds. So this is what we call the minor shirk, right? Where you are doing something for Allah, but then you're also mixing that intention with somebody else. Then I will absol absolve him, myself of him. And he is left to what he took as a partner to me. So this person, they're doing a deed. And maybe half of it is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and half of it is for somebody else. Then Allah is not in need of any partners. Allah will cancel that entire deed. And you won't have anything. And you will be left to look for your reward with that person that you did that thing for. So this is a, a very serious hadith. Which shows that even if you have the slightest amount of mixing that intention with something else, then this is a, a pot potential reason for this entire deed to be rejected. And you lose out the reward of that. And uh, another hadith, uh, Rasulullah says, whoever acts to be heard and seen, Allah will cause his false to be, to, uh, to be heard and seen. So they, uh, they're doing deeds to for show, for people to hear and see them. So Allah will flip that around and make his false uh, intentions be heard and seen. And uh, a number of quotes about uh, the importance of intention. This is a very important topic. Inshallah, we will discuss this topic in a little bit more detail in, an, in, a, uh, in a future session uh, when it comes to intentions and uh, more details with that. We're not going to read uh, all of these, but these are what he brings after that is a number of quotes of some of the scholars and righteous uh, about the importance of the intention. Um, we'll mention a few of them, inshallah. There's a verse in the Quran, Kullu, kullu shayin halikun illa wajha. Right? Everything shall parrot except for his countenance. Uh, and this interpretation, one of the interpretations of this is that everything that is not done for his sake shall perish. Right? So there's a verse in the Quran, everything will be destroyed except for Allah's countenance. And one interpretation is that everything that was not done for Allah's sake will perish. All right, and then uh, he brings after that at the end of this section uh, the uh, advice to those who are dealing with uh, teachers and people of religion. Make sure that they are not uh, using the religion for their own personal gain. Not using your religion for your own personal gain. So he mentions here the... Uh, the last quote here, Sufyan says, O reciters of the Qur'an, raise your heads, for there can be no greater humility than which is concealed in the heart. The way, in, the way is well known, therefore fear Allah and seek your own sustenance and do not be dependent on Muslim charity. Sometimes people who are, uh, uh, there, are there might be people who are, have, Allah has gifted with recitation of the Qur'an and they use that as a means of sustenance. And this, this is something that should be generally avoided, to just use that as a means of sustenance. Uh, and putting their, uh, their, their dependence on the creation instead of the creator. All right, uh, moving on to the next uh, branch of Iman. As-Sadis wal-Arba'oon min shu'ab al-Iman as-surur bil-hasana wal-iqtinam wal-iqtimam bil-sayyya Happiness when one has done a good deed and sorrow when one has committed a sin. So we are all children of Adam. And we all make mistakes, we all commit sins. Uh, but the important thing is that what is your mindset when you commit a sin? Or what is your mindset when you do a good deed? So we have the hadith here, narrated by, narrated by Abu Dawood, uh, that Umar radiallahu uh, anhu says that uh, whoever is made happy by his good deed and sorrowful by committing sin is a believer. This is a sign of Iman that you are happy when you do good deeds and you are sorrow you are in a state of sorrow when you commit sins this is a sign of iman because everyone makes mistakes everyone commits sins
but what's your mindset after you commit the sin? If you feel happy about it, you, you know, you're bragging about that sin, you feel good about it, then this is a, there's a problem. All right? Or you commit, a, or you do a good deed, and you feel miserable, or you don't feel satisfied with it, or you don't feel uh, content with it, then this is a problem, right? So you have to look at your, yourself. If you feel happiness when you're doing good, and you feel remorse when you're doing evil, then this is a sign of Iman. This is a sign of Iman. But once a person starts to become uh, numb to, to, to doing evil, and they don't feel any remorse, and they don't feel anything, then this is a sign that this person has some very low Iman, and issues with their Iman. So this is a sign of a belief, a sign of a believer, happiness when doing something good, and remorse and sorrow when they are doing something, uh, they've committed a sin. All right, uh, moving on to uh, the next branch of Iman. Treating every sin with repentance. And a number of verses are brought here, or a few verses. And turn to Allah in repentance, all you believers, that you might succeed. And the other verse, O oh, you who believe, repent to Allah with sincere repentance. And return in repentance to your Lord and submit to Him. So this is what we call tawbah. And tawbah has conditions. All right, tawbah has conditions. Uh, and the scholars have mentioned three main conditions. And there's a fourth one that can be added as well. Anybody knows those conditions? What are the conditions for tawbah? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he, he turns to Allah, right? And then, oh, good. So you have so he does not return to the sin, right? That's one. What, what was the other one you mentioned? Okay, sincere remorse, All right? Remorse. That's two. And there's one more. Okay, so that, that's all part of tawbah, right? So regret, don't return to the sin, and there's something else. All right, that's the fourth potential one. All right, um, we'll leave that off for now. Uh, and let's look for that third one. Yeah. That's not a condition for valid repentance, but that's good to do. But that's not a condition. All right, so the, the third condition is stopping the sin. So you cannot repent if you're still doing the sin, right? So you have to stop. So the first thing is uh, remorse or stopping the sin first, right? Uh, remorse and not going back to it. And if you want to remember these, these three conditions easily, just think of past, present, future. Past meaning you are regretful. You're sorry you committed sin. In other words, you're not happy and bragging about it. You know, some people, they commit a sin and yeah, you know, I did this 20 years ago and it seems as though they're bragging about it. Right? They, might, they might say that they repented, but then they're talking about it as though um, you know, they're happy that they did it. So you have to have sorrow. Past, present, meaning you're not committing the sin at the moment. You have stopped the sin. And uh, future, you pledge not to go back to it. Right? So past, present, future, those are the three conditions. And there's the fourth condition, which is if that sin is dealing with another human being, then you need to fix that. Right? So if you stole somebody's money, you can't just make tawbah with these three conditions. You need to return back the money, or else that tawbah is not valid. All right. So if you, uh, if you, if the, if the sin is between you and Allah, then these three first three conditions apply. But if this sin has to do with a fellow uh, believer, then now you must make up for that. Whatever you, the right you took from them, then you need to return it back. No, once you have repented from that sin, you can continue, right? Um, because we don't know if Allah has accepted our repentance. So that's good to continue. Um, but once Allah has accepted it, then you don't necessarily have to continue to re repent. Uh, once you have fulfilled the conditions, then we, it, it's, it is hoped that Allah will accept your repentance if you're sincere and you have fulfilled the conditions. So you don't necessarily have to repent, 
but it might be something good to do if especially if we don't know that whether Allah has accepted it or not but um, theori theoretically speaking if you have repented and you have fulfilled the conditions of repentance then that sin is removed and you don't need to seek repentance from it again all right but that's assuming that Allah has accepted the repentance which we you know ne we're not necessarily sure of so those are three conditions for a valid repentance and then the fourth one if if it deals with uh, a fellow human being they need to return uh, that right that you've taken, you've taken for them or if you slandered them the scholars have mentioned that you need to go and apologize to that person if you backbited them you need to go and apologize to that person you need to seek their forgiveness because the things that are between people will be settled between people all right so any wrongs that you have done to somebody else then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow those two people to settle it and if you don't settle it in this life then it's going to be settled in the, ne in the next life and in the next life the currency in the next life is deeds so if you haven't settled something in this life you wrong somebody in this life and you didn't settle it then it has to be settled in the next life then what's going to end up happening is that you have to pay for that crime you committed by giving deeds giving your deeds away and nobody wants to lose deeds your hard earned good deeds on the day of judgment you don't want to give those away on the day of judgment so settle anything you have between somebody else in this life before the next life comes where the currency is deeds and if you have to pay somebody it's going to be by giving away your good deeds and uh, there's a hadith on that if you have no more good deeds left then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make you take the evil deeds of that person that you wronged so if you have no good deeds left to give out you end up having to take evil deeds on your plate Right, so if you have that, uh, the, the question is, if you have an addiction to something, uh, how do you go about seeking repentance? For this, you make the sincere intention. If it happens again, you make tawbah again. And you continue this process. All right, but obviously, for certain situations, you might need to maybe get like a professional help or something in, in, in a situation like that. Allahu Akbar. And then we have the hadith uh, in which uh, reported that Rasulullah says, My heart is sometimes clouded and I ask for Allah's forgiveness a hundred times a day. Uh, this, this hadith is a bit uh, unclear in the meaning. When he says clouded, does it mean that uh, Rasulullah committed any sin? Um, it mentions here in the, in the footnote uh, that uh, it just means that Rasulullah, either he became deeply engrossed in matters of the ummah to the point where he would not be able to pay attention to his own worship. Right? So, Rasulullah has established such a high level right, of praying Qiyam every single night and doing whatever he did that sometimes, because he's so busy with the affairs of the Ummah, it would uh, prevent him from his, uh, his own worship. And so, because of this, he would uh, seek uh, forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 100 times a day. Right? It's not because he committed any sin, but because he did not, uh, he, he did not do to, uh, the deeds to the level of their standard that he established for himself. Right? So it's not, it doesn't mean that he did any uh, sins. All right. And uh, the scholars also mentioned that forgiveness as well is not, it's not necessarily done because of a sin, because, especially in the case of Rasulullah, but it's also for raising his level. So he seeks forgiveness not because he committed a sin, but to raise his level even higher. And this is a means of raising his level. Yes, yeah. A majority of times, we had, we had discussed this uh, earlier, I think one of, one of the first or second session, when we talked about this whole concept of branches of Iman, right? We said that uh, Rasulullah says in the hadith that Iman is 60 or 70 branches. And we said that oftentimes the number is not meant to be taken literal. Right? The number is not meant to be taken literal. And uh, this is also would apply here. 100 times, other hadith mentions 70 as well. 70 times a day he seeks forgiveness. So uh, oftentimes the number is not meant to be taken literal, but what, what's meant is a lot, a lot. So it, it's not necessarily that he did, you know, he counted every single time, 100 times a day, but it is uh, something that is meant to be, uh, indicate that he did it often and a lot, frequently. All right, moving on to الثامن والأربعون من شعب الإيمان القرابين وجملتها الهدي والأضحية والعقيقة. Sacrifices and three things fall under sacrifices. 
We have the uh, what we call the hadi. This is the sacrifice that you make in Hajj, all right? Uh, the sacrifice that you make in Hajj, and then there's the sacrifice of Eid, the Eid al-Adha, and there's a sacrifice for the Aqiqah. Right? There's, there's three sacrifices uh, where we slaughter an animal, where we slaughter an animal. Uh, and uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says in the Quran, "Fasalli li Rabbika wanhar." So pray to your Lord and sacrifice, and sacrifice. And uh, Allah says, "Wal budna jaalnaha lakum min shaa'il Allah, lakum fiha khair." And the camels and the cattle we have appointed for you as among the symbols of Allah for you therein is good. And Allah says in another verse, "Wa man yu'alim shaa'il Allah fi innaha min taqwa al So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala calls the cattle. And these animals that we sacrifice, he calls them symbols of Allah. Symbols of Allah. And then he says in another verse, whoever honors the symbols of Allah. So anything that is a symbol of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we need to honor it. And we need to respect it. So this would uh, apply, Allah alam, to oftentimes we see, in, in, uh, especially on the, the Eid al-Adha, where people start to kind of, you know, they make fun of the, um, the sheep. Or the goat, you know, you have memes. I'm sure you've seen memes, right? Of people talking and uh, making fun of the sheep or the goat or the, uh, or the cow that's being slaughtered. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls these animals, He calls them as symbols of Allah. So these things should be honored and you shouldn't make fun of them. Right? You should avoid making fun of the animals that will be slaughtered because Allah calls them symbols. They are symbols of Allah. And whoever, whoever honors the symbols of Allah, then indeed this is from the piety of the hearts. And uh, the hadith of Anas that Rasulullah used to offer a sacrifice of two white rams with horns. I saw him sacrificing them by placing his leg upon their sides and saying Bismillah and Allahu Akbar. So this is something that Rasulullah used to do himself. So whoever is able to, who, who has uh, slaughtered before themselves? Anybody else? Who's actually taken the knife and slaughtering? Yeah, okay. Yeah, How, how's, the, how's the experience? I guess when you get used to it, it's, um, well, when you first do it, you know, it can be a bit um, intimidating, right? Um, but this is something uh, you should maybe try to do at least once, all right, if you can. And I know it's, uh, especially if you're not used to it, it can be something difficult, but try to do it. This is a sunnah of Rasulullah that he slaughtered himself, right? He slaughtered himself. So three things, right? Three sacrifices, the Hajj sacrifice, the sacrifice with four Eid, and the Aqiqah. All right, moving on. التاسر والأربعون من شعب الإيمان طاعة الأمر بقوله تعالى أطيع الله وأطيع الرسول وأولي الأمر منكم Obedience to those in authority. Of course, this is referring to the Islamic authority. This is referring to the Islamic authority, the rightful Islamic authority, which was uh, in the early days the Khilafa, or the Khilafa and then later on became uh, the uh, dynasties, the Islamic dynasties. Uh, so those in authority, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Obey Allah and His Messenger and those in authority among, amongst you. And, and those in authority amongst you. Um, if we notice on this verse, Allah says, Allah wa Rasul. He brings the verb for obedience for Allah and obedience for Rasulullah But He does not bring that same verb again for wa ulil amli minkum. Right? He does not, so He says, Allah, Obey Allah and obey the Rasul. But he does not bring the verb again the third time and obey ulil amri minkum. But he rather he attaches it to obedience of Allah and His Messenger. So this is dependent. Obey Allah and obey His Messenger, and those in authority amongst you, as long as they are obeying Allah and their and the Messenger. So this authority and obedience is absolute to Allah, and it is absolute to Rasulullah But it is not absolute to anybody else. It is dependent on whether they are. Uh, in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, there's a hadith on that. La ta'ata li makhluq fi ma'asiyatillah. There's no obedience to a creation if that entails disobedience to the creator. Right? So, obedience to Allah is absolute. Obedience to Rasulullah is absolute. Obedience to those in authority is conditional. It is, it is conditional. And that's why Allah did not repeat that verb of obeying uh, in that, uh, when mentioning them. Now, the authority that's mentioned here. It refers to the, the rulers. It also refers to the scholars as well. Right? The scholars are those who t t teach us the religion, they inform us what is halal, what is haram, and 
It is the responsibility of the non-scholars, the laymen, to ask. فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask those of knowledge if you do not know. Ask the people of dhikr if you do not know. So if you ask those of knowledge and they give you a ruling, this is haram, then you have to obey them. Right? You have to obey them because now they are relaying to you Allah's judgment and Allah's ruling. So it refers to the, those in authority and also refers to the scholars as well. It refers to the scholars as well. Now, the issue comes up. What happens if the ruler is oppressive? If the ruler is oppressive. And we have hadith on that. Uh, where Rasulullah says that even if the ruler is oppressive, you still need to obey him as long as obeying him does not entail disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the hadith specifically mentions even if he beats your back, you still have to obey him, meaning don't rebel against him. Don't rebel against him. And all this is for the greater good. For the greater good. Because what happens is, if the ruler is oppressive, this is an evil. But then what happens if people try to rebel, then what's going to happen? The ruler is going to clamp down. He's going to, there's going to be a bunch of bloodshed and it's going to lead to even greater evil. So because of that, the general rule is that as long as the, the, the ruler is a believer, he's a believer, he's still a Muslim, then he's not allowed to rebel against him because this will cause a greater fitna. This will cause a greater uh, evil. Even though, if he, even though if, he, if he is oppressive, this is not something accepted, right? He should be advised, obviously. But rebelling, because this will cause a greater evil, Rasulullah has uh, prohibited that. And so we have a number of hadith where uh, the Prophet uh, he emphasizes the need, to, the need to obey the rulers. Uh, so we have the hadith here, whoever obeys me has obeyed Allah, whoever disobeys me has disobeyed Allah, whoever obeys the commander has obeyed me, whoever disobeys him has disobeyed me. And in another hadith, uh, Rasulullah said to Abu Dhar, O Abu Dhar, hear and obey even if it to be a limbless Abyssinian slave. Right? So even if it's a person who you're not used to being a person of authority, how, and this person has no limbs, even if that's the case, you have to obey. Right? As long as the, the leader is a legitimate Islamic leader, then he must be obeyed, even if he is uh, oppressive. And uh, because if we, uh, let, uh, we allow rebellion against the, the ruler, then this is going to cause greater uh, corruption. This will cause greater corruption. Of course, there's a lot of details to this, but this is the general rule and principle that the Islamic ruler must be obeyed. Uh, as long as the, the hadith mentions as well that as long as you don't see clear kufr from him, as long as you don't see clear kufr from the leader, then he must be obeyed and it's not allowed to rebel. So this was the 49th uh, branch of Islam. And uh, by the way, at the end of this hadith, even if, he, if, even if he is a limbless Abyssinian slave, this is an indication that even if the ruler got into power by force, let's say there was a, a rebellion by somebody else, and uh, the ruler took power by force, and now he is the ruler, even if it's legit illegitimate, he didn't come by legitimate means, but now he it becomes the ruler, he must be obeyed because now he's the legitimate ruler. Right? Even if he got to that, that post by illegitimate means, he shed blood to get there. Once he did that, that's between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but once he becomes the legitimate ruler, then he is uh, to be obeyed and uh, rebellion is prohibited. Yes, yeah, right. So that's, that's an example, right? Uh, Abbas has overthrew the Umayyads, right? And there was a lot of bloodshed. But once they came to power, then they became the legitimate Islamic authority. And this uh, rebelling against them becomes prohibited. Being Muslims. Being Muslims, because uh, as we mentioned, the Hadith mentions even if they are disobedient, as long as they don't commit clear kufr, clear kufr, then they are still the legitimate Islamic authorities. Like uh, denying something that is known to the deen by necessity, denying that there's something called salah, or denying something else. Mm. All right. So what's the next steps? So we have. Uh, a so-called Islamic leader, and he has displayed clear disbelief. 
All right, this goes back now to weighing the pros and cons. All right, weighing the pros and cons. So it might be permissible to rebel against that person, but it, you'd have to look at the situation. Are the Muslims able to remove that person? If they're not able to remove him, then this will lead to, once again, it leads to a greater harm. So this person, they might be a disbeliever, but if you rebel against them, thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people are going to be killed. You don't have the ability to rebel. You don't have the, the means. So in a situation like that, not because it's haram to rebel, but because it's not practical to rebel, then the situation will have to remain how it is. But of course it gets, you know, this, when it comes to politics, you know, it, it becomes very complicated because there's a number of different factors involved. Right. 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 I, I, of course, we don't, uh, this doesn't mean that uh, we are to accept the oppression, right? Uh, the, hadith also, the hadith have come mentioning that um, the, the greatest, um, I can't remember the word in hadith, but uh, the greatest jihad or something like that is a, uh, a, a word, uh, a truthful word in front of a, uh, a tyrant, in front of a tyrant. So this indicates that if there's a tyranny going on in oppression, that this should be addressed. And the, the, the person doing that should not be allowed to just do it. That they should be uh, addressed, but in a, in, a, in, a, in a proper way, in a proper way. Right. Mm. Right. Yeah. This. 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 This is one of the situations where du'a is accepted. Da'atul mazlum. Yeah. That's. That's one alternative, of course. Yes. Right. There's an oppressive ruler. Then the first step would be to du'a. Right. There's. There's. There is a step-by-step -step process. Right. The last step, absolute last step, is physical rebellion. Right. But this is, all right, uh, conditional. Looking at the situation, you're able to do so. Is that going to cause more harm than good? All right. So th this is what uh, it would depend on the situation. But the first thing would be to advise the ruler, right? Advising the ruler, speaking to the ruler, uh, making and if it comes to that, then making du'a against him, and then going by that uh, step by step process. But of course, as we said, this is it's, it's a, a complicated issue because when politics get involved and all the different situations, then y it's very difficult to give any blanket rulings, right? Everything has to be assessed in their own situation. Uh, the fifth year, branch of Iman. Al Khamsun min Shu'ab al Iman, at Tamasuk bima alayhi al Jama'ah. Sticking to the Jama'ah, sticking to the body of Muslims, the main body of Muslims. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa atasimu bi habli lahi jami'ah. And hold firmly to the rope of Allah together, all together, and do not become divided. And the hadith, whoever is disobedient and departs from the jama'ah, then he dies. And then, then that person dies, has died in a state of jahiliyyah. Has, has died in a state of jahiliyyah. So if, there, if the Muslims are united under you know, one leader, then it becomes incumbent on all the Muslims to stick to that one leader, under the banner of that one leader. And whoever departs from that, then it's alike, they are dying in a state of jahiliyyah. And uh, the hadith, uh, after I'm, I, I am gone, there will come days of corruption and turmoil. When you see people dividing the, um, the, the unity of the ummah, then you must kill them, whoever they happen to be. This is, of, of course, this is not addressing uh, any random person. This is addressing the people who will have uh, the sahaba and those who have the uh, position of leadership. That when people are coming to challenge the unity of the Muslims, then they must be dealt with. Right? They must be dealt with, or else this will cause even greater harm to the entire ummah. So hurling, holding, hurling, holding firmly to the jama'ah. This is why we call ourselves, what we call ourselves, Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah. The people of Sunnah and Jama'ah. These two things together. We follow the Sunnah of Rasulullah and we also stick to the main body of the Muslims. And we don't uh, join this sect or this group and this group. We stick to the main body of Muslims. This is the term Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Mm-hmm. 
I'm not sure if I understand the question. So like, Yeah, uh, so the question is about contentious figures, contentious figures. Um, every, every scholar has mistakes, right? There's nobody from after Rasulullah until the Day of Judgment uh, who's perfect, right? Everyone has mistakes and errors. So as long as they remain in the, within the, the, uh, the realm of Ahl Sunnah and Jama'ah, then, then we accept them and we benefit from them, all right? We accept and benefit from them. And there is no scholar, past or present, where you'll find that everything they say is correct. There's gonna be mistakes. Uh, they might have an issue where they departed from what the correct, uh, the correct uh, position should be. And this happens, right? As long as they still maintain the, uh, that description of being from the people of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, then this, is, uh, this would be considered uh, people that we can benefit from, right? But it, of course it depends on um, you'd have to go back to the scholars to, you know, the, the scholars, it's not something for everybody to determine themselves. They have to go back to the scholars uh, and, and see what the, you know, the main group of scholars, you know, if we have a consensus on an issue, go back to the consensus of the scholars and see what are the scholars saying. And they will be able to identify if this is a mistake or not, right? Because otherwise, if we leave it up to anybody to determine this is a mistake, this is a mistake, then we'll have everybody declaring everyone else to be mistaken. All right, so we leave that to the scholars to say, this scholar, he made a mistake in this issue, and we don't accept that from him, but he's still a scholar, and we still love and respect and admire him, and we still can benefit from him. All right, so we go back to what the scholars uh, have, have said, the, 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 the mass body of scholars, what they say about an individual scholar, then, then we take that, what they say about them. Allahu Akbar. All right, moving on to uh, 51. الحادي والخمسون من شعب الإيمان الحكم بين الناس بالعدل. Passing judgment between people with justice. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa taala says in, in the verse, and when you judge between people, وإذا حكمت بين الناس فحكم بينهم بالعدل. And when you judge between people, judge with justice. And the verse, and do not uh, be for the deceitful and advocate. And the verse, act justly. Indeed, Allah loves those who act justly. In many verses of this nature. Uh, and even more emph emphasized is being uh, just even if the person is family, right? Uh, even the person is family. Allah says, even if it's against, against yourself, being just, even if that means siding with somebody who is non-family, or even if it means going against yourself, all this is what justice means. That even if it's against your own self, even if it's against your own family, you side with justice and you don't side with uh, injustice, no matter who it is. And even for an enemy, uh, as Allah says in the Quran, uh, And do not let your hatred for a person cause you to be unjust. Do not let your dislike and hatred for a person, even if that person is an enemy, cause you to be unjust. Even for an enemy, justice is required. Act justly, indeed Allah loves those who act justly. And the hadith, only two men may be envied. We mentioned this hadith before, right? A man who, whom Allah has given wealth. And he uses it by spending in ways in which Allah uh, pleases him. And a man whom Allah has given wisdom and he judges in accordance with it and teaches it to others. So we mentioned that what's meant by envy here is not the uh, literal definition of envy, but it's what's meant here is wanting to be like this person. And this is allowed uh, in these two cases and in other cases as well, but these two are even more emphasized. The one who has been given wealth and he uses that wealth to spend it in the, in the cause of Allah and the one who's been given wisdom and he judges uh, in accordance with it and teaches it to others. And 
be careful, and we mentioned this, uh, we just mentioned this, uh, the hadith about uh, the dua of the oppressed. So the opposite of being uh, just is being unjust. And when you are unjust with people and you oppress people, then now you are opening yourself up to the dua of the oppressed. Be careful with the dua of the oppressed. Because there is no barrier between it and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as it comes in the hadith. Be careful of the dua of the oppressed because there is no barrier between it and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning that dua is accepted. A person who has been oppressed, they make dua, then their dua is accepted. So be careful when it comes to being unjust because this can be a cause of a person making dua against you and that dua being, being accepted and you being brought to account for that. Uh, yes. Mm-hmm. How do you know if a person is oppressed? Um, who, who, how does who know? How does who know? How do, like if you are oppressed, how do you know if you are oppressed? Uh, repeat the question again. Hmm. Hmm. I mean, if, if, how, how would you know somebody is oppressed if they, if they do something wrong, right? If they, if they take a right, take your rights away, right? They steal from you, they harm you, or any, 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 anything that they do that is not lawful. This is oppression. Malum is the one who's oppressed, the one who had his right taken from him, right? So somebody took your money, right? Or somebody attacked you without reason. You are oppressed, meaning that somebody did something unlawful against you. This is the meaning of being oppressed. Oh yes. Athani wal khamsun min shu'ab al iman al amru bil ma'roof wa nahyu anil munkar. Commanding the good and uh, forbidding the evil. Commanding the good and forbidding the evil. And there are a number of verses on this. Wal takum minkum ummatun yaduuna ila al khair wa yamuruna bil ma'roof wa yanhauna anil munkar. Ulaika hum al muflihun. And the verse Kuntum Khiru Matin Ukrijatin Nasa Muruna bin Ma'roof wa ten hawna ala munkari wa took me nuna billah. this is uh, a number of verses are uh, mentioned regarding enjoining good and forbidding evil. Some of the scholars have mentioned that this is the sixth pillar of uh, of Islam. You have the five pillars of Islam and this is can be considered number six because of its importance. Alright, uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that let there be arising from you a nation inviting all to all that is good and enjoying what is right and forbidding what is wrong and those will be successful and a number of the verses are, have been mentioned and Allah also mentions one of the downfalls of the children of Israel Bani Israel one of their downfalls is that they did not command good or forbid evil all right uh, as the verse says here curse were those who disbelieved amongst the children of Israel by the tongue of David and of Jesus the son of Mary that was because they disobeyed and habitually transgressed. They used to not prevent one another from wrongdoing that they did. So this is one of the downfalls of Bani Israel that they did not command the good and they did not forbid the evil. How wretched was that which they were doing. And this is one of the reasons why uh, they were punished because they stopped commanding good and forbidding evil. So sometimes they might have been good themselves, but they would see an evil and they would leave it. And this is what happened in the, uh, in the story of uh, Yom As-Sabt when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded Bani Israel, you're not allowed to fish on Saturdays. Right? You're not allowed to fish on Saturdays. And then Allah tested them. He tested them by making all the fish come out on Saturdays. So they, they resorted to pulling kind of a trick. They put the nets out on Friday to say that, well, we're not fishing on Saturday because we put the nets out on Friday. But in, in essence, they were fishing on Saturday because that's when the fish were being collected. And so when this happened, the people were three, divided into three groups. We had one group who were doing this evil, disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You had another group who were condemning them. And then you had a third group who were silent, who were silent. Uh, and these are mentioned in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the story in the Quran about those who transgressed on the day of 
Sabt, Yom al -Sabt. So this was the, uh, one of the downfalls of the children of Israel is that they did not used to prevent evil. Uh, and then we have the hadith, whoever sees something evil should change it with his hand. If he cannot, then with his tongue. If he cannot, then do even that, then, do, then even with his heart and in his heart. And this is the weakest degree of faith. So there is a step-by-step um, -step process that you can change it with your hand. And this is reserved usually for people of authority. All right? This is not for you know, anybody you see you doing something wrong, you go and stop them. Especially in Islamic society, this is the, uh, the function and, and uh, right of the ruler and the authority to stop uh, evil with, uh, by force, all right? uh, by stopping with the hand. So this is usually reserved for the Islamic authority. And if you cannot do that, when, then with your tongue advising. And if you cannot do that, then hate it in your heart. And that's the weakest of Iman. That is the weakest of Iman. Uh, and we'll mention uh, the hadith, uh, this important hadith as well. Uh, that the Prophet ﷺ, he once uh, awoke and his face was dark. As he said three times, there's no one worthy of worship except for Allah. Woe to the Arabs because of an evil which soon will come, which will soon come. Today, the barrier of Ya'juj and Ma'juj has been breached by so much. And he made a, like a circle with his thumb and his forefinger. This amount. So we know that Ya'juj and Ma'juj, they were two tribes of people who existed in the past. And they caused a lot of corruption on the earth. And so, Dhul uh, Qarnayn, he put a barrier to stop them and uh, trap them and stop them from causing mischief and corruption in the earth. And this is uh, one of the signs of the Day of Judgment, the major signs of the Day of Judgment, that they will return. That they will return, that they're going to break this barrier that was set for them. And once this barrier has been broken, then this is one of the major signs of the Day of Judgment. So Rasulullah says that, and this is back in his time, that it has been breached by this amount, right, this amount. And then when, uh, his wife Zainab radiallahu anha, she remarked, he said, Oh Rasulullah, even when the righteous still dwell amongst us. He said, yes, when corruption becomes widespread. So uh, she's asking, is it possible that calamities can strike and destruction can occur even when there's still righteous people amongst us? And Rasulullah said that if widespread, uh, corruption becomes widespread, meaning no one is commanding the good anymore. No one is forbidding the evil. So there might be righteous people. However, they're not trying to stop the evil. They're not commanding the good. Then this is a reason for potential destruction, destruction of uh, that, those people. Uh, he brings an interesting statement here. He says, uh, there's a verse in the Quran talking about the people of um, uh, Thamud. So the people of Thamud were destroyed. Right? They were destroyed because of nine people. There were nine people who killed the she-camel. Right? So the people of Thamud, uh, they were sent, sent to them were Prophet Salih salam, And they asked for a miracle. They said, bring us a miracle. If you bring us a miracle, then we're going to believe. And they specified that miracle. They said, bring us a she-camel from the sky. And uh, Prophet Salih salam, brought, it, brought it down. And they still disbelieved. And they plotted and planned against this camel. And they killed it. Uh, the people who killed it were nine people. And in there, there were in the city nine family heads, meaning nine people, causing corruption in the land and not amending its affairs. And because of these nine people, they're the ones who went and killed the she camel. They're the ones who brought destruction upon the entire uh, people of Thamud. And they were all destroyed because of these nine people. So uh, Malik ibn Dinari says, nowadays there are people in every clan and every district to cause corruption in the earth and do not cause reform. All right, so back in those days, there were only nine of them. Now he says, Everywhere, in every clan, in every district, there are people causing corruption on the earth. So this is a potential cause for destruction because of that. Um, <clears throat> a question that could come up, right, which is, uh, we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not uh, bear the burdens of one person to another. That Allah does not cause one person to bear the burdens of another. So how is it possible that a righteous person can be destroyed even though he's not unrighteous himself. What do we think? What do you think about that? How is it possible that a person can be destroyed and he is himself is righteous, but nonetheless he's still destroyed when we know that Allah, Allah does not cause 
uh, a person to bear the, the, the sins of another person. Yeah. Okay, possibly. It could be a means of protecting him. All right, possibly. Anybody else? All right, that could also be it, right? That maybe this person is righteous to himself, but because they are not actively trying to change, then this opens them up for, not that, not that they are being punished, but this opens up for them to have the same fate as those who are unrighteous, right? And um, uh, there's, there's a, the verse in the Quran, um, I can't recall the verse right now, but there, there's a verse that Allah will not destroy people uh, as long as they are muslihun, as long as they are actively trying to rectify the situation, then Allah will not destroy those people, right? Allah will not destroy those people. And uh, there is a hadith as well, uh, end times hadith, where Rasulullah says that a, a army will attack the Kaaba. This is the, towards the end of time. They're gonna, uh, an army is going to come and they're going to attack the Kaaba. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cause that, uh, this army to be swallowed up. Right, this army will be swallowed up by the earth. And Aisha radiallahu anha, she asks Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa that uh, this entire army is going to be swallowed up, but in this army, there are people who are not intending to fight. So uh, there might be people who are just there as cooks, right? Cooks or medics, or you know, just having some other function, but they're not fighting, and so they're not actively doing the evil. So she asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa how are they going to be you know, why are they being punished? Why are they being swallowed by the earth when they don't have the intention of attacking the Kaaba? And Rasulullah he answered that all of them will be swallowed up, but they will all be raised on, according to their intention. So they're all going to be, they're all going to share the same fate, but they will all be resurrected according to their intention. They will be resurrected according to their uh, intentions. So it's possible that a person is righteous. But because they live in an unrighteous society, they will share the same fate as that society. But on the Day of Judgment, they will be re resurrected according to their own intentions. Wallahu Alright. Uh, cooperation in goodness and piety, Allah says, and cooperate in righteousness and piety, but do not cooperate in sin and transgression. Anything that's good, cooperate with it in good. And anything that's evil, do not cooperate. Very simple, right? If anything that's good, then cooperate in good with each other. And do not cooperate in sin and transgression. Very important verse. And cooperate in righteousness and piety, but do not cooperate in sin and trans and aggression. And the hadith, uh, Help your brother whether he is wronged or he is doing wrong. The Sahaba were confused about this statement, right? Uh, because Rasulullah says, help your brother. This was, a, this was a, uh, before Rasulullah said this statement, this was a slogan in Jahiliya. Help your brother, whether he is oppressed or he is oppressing. This was a slogan in Jahiliya, but they had a different meaning. They had, a, they had this, uh, this type of what we call asabiyah, like uh, uh, where you are uh, loyal to your clan. They had this type of tribal loyalty. So they would have this saying, which is, help your fellow tribesmen, whether he is oppressing or he's oppressed, no matter what. Even if he's wrong, help them. And they would fight because of this. So one person would kill another tribes, a person from another tribe, and they would support that person, even if he's wrong, even if he committed murder. This was the slogan in Jahiliya, that as long as he's from our tribe, we're gonna support him no matter what. So Rasulullah repeated the statement, and the companions were confused. How could he say this statement when we know that what it used to mean in Jahiliya? And then he clarified to them the real meaning of the statement, which is by preventing him from doing it. So help him, even if he is a, an oppressor, by preventing him from doing it. And thus you can be of those who help him. Right? So helping him meaning not helping him and approving of his wrong, but stopping him from doing that. And this is helping him because you are preventing him from committing sins, right? So in that way, you are helping him. Yeah. Um, similar, very, very similar. And, and it's a synonym, a synonym, right? Aggression, transgression, I think they're synonyms. 
You can translate this word as transgression as well, right? The word is udwan. And this word, it can be translated both ways. Aggression or transgression. Right? Which is going beyond the, beyond the limits. Going beyond the limits. Arabi wal khamsun min shu'ab al-iman al-haya li hadithi Salim ibn Abdullah that uh, a person was being uh, reproached by another man and Rasulullah said leave him for shyness comes from faith da'hu fa inna al-haya min al-iman and uh, we know this from the very first hadith we took right about the the branches of iman wal haya'u shu'batun min al-iman that haya modesty is a branch of faith so uh, this hadith is about a, a man was he was criticizing one of his uh, friends he's saying you know you're too shy you're too shy you're being too shy and rasulullah said leave him leave this man because Shyness is from faith. So this is, this is looked down upon today. Shyness, is, you, if you're a shy person, this is looked down upon and is seen as a negative trait. But actually this is a positive trait and this is a branch from Iman. And in another, another hadith, Rasulullah says, modesty brings nothing except good. That uh, modesty and shyness does not bring anything except for good. Of course, there are certain types of shyness that is looked down upon. Right? So the type of shyness that will prevent a person, for example, from seeking knowledge, right? where you need to know something, but you are sh too shy to ask. Right? Too shy to ask, and this is a blameworthy type of shyness. So in general, shyness is praiseworthy, but there are certain times where shyness can be blameworthy. Sh shyness prevents you from learning your religion, right? or shyness prevents you from taking your right, and so on. Then shyness can become... Uh, Blameworthy in those situations. Uh, then there's a uh, hadith about the shyness of Rasulullah that uh, he was described as being more shy, more modest than a virgin in her tent. And in those days, women were very, very shy. Right? Obviously, the times have changed, right? But in those days, women were extremely shy. They would not even come out of their tents. They would not come out of their uh, the houses. And this is how Rasulullah was described: that he was more shy than the unmarried. Girl in her tent or in her uh, in her house, and if he disliked something, we would know it from his face. So when he would, when something would upset him, he wouldn't talk about it or he wouldn't uh, treat it with words. They would they would notice it from his facial uh, expression, whether he disliked something or not. Uh, and then we have the hadith. One of the things which people remember from the time of early prophecies is the saying: "If you have no modesty." then you might as well do as you wish. Uh, the hadith mentions, فَاسْنَعْ مَا شِئْتْ شِئْتْ Do what you wish. Which seems to be indicating, do whatever you want. But this is the, what we call uh, in Arabic, تَهْدِيد uh, which is a threat. A threat. So it's not meant to actually be taken literally, do whatever you want. What's, what's really meant is, be careful. Don't do whatever you want. But if you do so, then be prepared for the consequences. And Allah says in the Quran, it's very similar. Do whatever you want. But this is, this is not allowing to do whatever you want. But rather, this is a threat. Just like a, a parent, right? A parent will tell the child, if he tells him, you know, warns him, don't do that thing, then a parent will eventually use another method, which is go ahead, do it. Right? Go ahead and do it. But he's not actually giving permission for the child to do that. But he's actually threatening. If you do that, then there will be uh, consequences. So this is, uh, comes under that heading, which is, uh, do whatever you want meaning warning to those who have no shyness do whatever you want but there will be consequences to that uh, and this is a hadith that uh, it's in the hadith of uh, the 40 hadith of Inawi he brings this hadith as well that uh, one of the things which people remember from the time of early prophecies is saying is saying if you have no modesty then you might as well do as you wish if you have no modesty if you have, there's no more shyness uh, around, then people will do whatever they want. Once shyness has left, then people will do whatever we want. And we've, we see that in our society. There's no more shyness, there's no more modesty, and so people are doing whatever. And every, anything, anything goes. This is uh, what the people remember from the time of early prophecies. The scholars have mentioned that this is something that has been present in uh, the law of all the prophets. That this is something that cannot be abrogated. Shyness and modesty being uh, something praiseworthy. This is something that all the prophets taught. All the prophets taught this, that uh, this is something praiseworthy to be shy and modest. 
All right, uh, we will end with this, inshallah, number 54. Inshallah, next time we will begin uh, with the 55th branch of Iman. And we will end here today uh, with completing the 54th branch of Iman. Remember, next week we are starting earlier, uh, 6.30. We will start 6.30 and we will go until uh, Salat al-Isha, inshallah ta'ala. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala Sayyidina Muhammad alhamdulillah wa rabbil alameen. We will take questions, inshallah. Uh, no. Okay. Okay. Okay, number 15. All right, so there's no Islamic authority, right? So what do, we, what do we do with people who are causing, so there are people who are causing disunity, um, specifically by claiming uh, what, like homosexuality is allowed or something? All right, so there's certain people who are claiming all right, things that are obviously, yeah. Hmm. All right, so there's, there's people who are trying to change the religion and try to distort the religion and are trying to modernize the religion, right? Saying things like homosexuality are, is not permissible. These things are okay, All right? So how do we deal with people like that? How do we deal with people like that? Uh, it goes back to the hadith we mentioned earlier about uh, changing whoever sees an, e an evil, right? You try to change it with your hand, right? Physically stop it. As we mentioned, this is for the Islamic authority. We don't have an Islamic authority, so we cannot go and physically, you know, stop people from, you know, distorting the religion, right? We cannot go and, you know, throw people in prison or attack people. We cannot do that, right? That's, that's the job of the Islamic authority. So then it goes down to the next step, which is, uh, if you're not able to stop with your hand, فبلساني, then with your tongue, using your tongue, meaning speaking out against it. Speaking out against it, or in some certain cases, you know, writing about it uh, in terms of uh, online writing articles and so on, speaking about it, warning against it. Right? That would be the next step. And this is within our capability. Right? We haven't been prevented from uh, from expressing what our religion says. Right? As of yet, maybe the time will come where we will not be able to. But as of now, we can still say that homosexuality is not allowed in Islam. We can still say that, and this is we are protected under free speech. As long as we're not calling to anybody to be harmed or we're not calling for anybody to, you know, uh, to be oppressed or anything of that nature, but we are simply stating what our beliefs are as Muslims, this is still within our right as Americans. So we can still move down to that second level, which is speaking against it with your tongue. All right, so we still have that uh, option available. All right. Mm -hmm. Right, so the question is, has this happened before where people have tried to distort the religion? And the answer is yes. Since the very beginning, there have been deviant deviations, deviant groups. From the time of the Sahaba, this started, right? Um, where people have tried to distort the religion and bring foreign ideas. And the same thing happened, right? If there's an Islamic authority, then they would take care of those people, all right? And the scholars would also speak again about that. And they would write books, many books have been written, refuting certain ideas and uh, talking about certain issues and addressing it. So this has happened since the very beginning. And we mentioned right at the, uh, in the first class, right, about the issue of Al-Qadr, that there were people starting to deny Al-Qadr. And they came to Abdullah bin Umar and he said that, tell them that I'm free from them, they're free from me. And whoever, uh, if, if they were to give a mountain's worth of gold of Uhud, it will not be accepted from them because they brought this deviation. So this has been uh, since the very beginning of Islam, after Rasulullah passed away, there have been people who have brought different ideas and strange beliefs. And from, that, from then until now, the scholars have addressed this in their writings and in, in their uh, speeches, talking about this. And in certain situations, when there were Islamic authorities, then they would also take care of these people by force. 
All right, there was an incident uh, where there was one of these people who were, was spreading uh, these kind of beliefs, uh, heretical beliefs. And um, it happened to be the day of Eid, right? The day of Eid. And they were slaughtering their sacrifices. And the Khalifa came out and he said, you have offered your sacrifices and now I'm going to offer my sacrifice. And they, they brought this person who was bringing all these very strange heretical beliefs and he was executed on, on, that, on that day. But this, of course, is the uh, job of the Islamic Authority. And it has to reach that level where they have done uh, something which causes them to uh, warrant that punishment. So this is the job of the Islamic Authority to physically stop this, and this has happened before. And the scholars have, since then, and they continue to do so, warned against in, the, in their writings and in their, and in their words. Allah Alright, any other questions? Okay, so we will stop here for today. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Nashadu wa la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayhi. We continue. We have two more sessions, inshallah. And then we will uh, be finished completing, completing the book. And then uh, we will have a Ramadan break. And then, inshallah, we will give announcements of what will come after. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.